it's been almost a year, it's been a year, had it? It's been over a year, right in a year uh, since we have Wednesday night services in here. So I'm excited to be back in here, excited to see what God is doing. Uh, so good to have all of you here with us tonight. And uh, we're going to kind of pick up where we left off last week with fasting. Um, and this is still going to be interactive, so you guys are certainly welcome to ask questions. Jamie, you got a question, just grab a mic back there and, and ask a question. Um, and uh, before we get into that tonight, a couple of things. Um, our Keepers of the Command, our youth group, is launching. Um, tonight was, is the first night for that. Um, so if you or anyone here in the church is interested in the youth and being part of that, Alicia is our youth pastor, and she'll be taking on that program, and she'll be running that. We're excited for that. Um, I have seen the t-shirt designs, and they're pretty awesome. And uh, I can't wait to get my old t-shirt and, uh, and proudly wear it up here as I preach. Um, but we're really looking forward to what God's going to do in that program and, uh, and get that going. So uh, that's going to be for ages 12 and up um, to start with. And then we'll see how things go. And hopefully we will grow to the point that we need two groups. Um, so that'll be every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. here in the sanctuary, here in the church. Um, invite your friends, bring your friends. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to that. And thank you, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. Water there. Hallelujah. Also, um, so Wednesday nights going forward, we'll be back in here uh, for services at 7 p.m. You're welcome to come out and join us, be a part of the services here on Wednesday night. And uh, it is still going to be uh, kind of an informal, um, interactive uh, teaching slash preaching uh, slash fun time together uh, to learn about God's Word and, and uh, to study together. So come out and join us on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. And then, of course, we have our services Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. So. Uh, good to have you guys here tonight. We're going to open up in prayer, and then uh, then we're going to get into uh, to a discussion tonight on fasting. So let's pray. Heavenly Father God, I thank you tonight. I praise you. I give you honor and glory. I thank you, God, for what you're doing in this church. I thank you, God, for what you're doing for the people. I thank you, God, for just everything, God. Every every blessing that you're giving us, everything that you're your your hand of provision, your mercy, your grace, Lord. The, the increase in our in our church family, the body of Christ. I thank you, Lord, for such a wonderful Resurrection Sunday, God. I praise you for that. We just had a wonderful time and a great turnout, and I just give you honor and glory. And God, I pray that with what you're doing now in the church, the the, the things that are shifting and moving and, and happening, God, that you would just continue to keep your hand upon us. Lord, help us to learn something new tonight, see something that we've never seen before. Lord, help us to get some fresh revelation into your word, God. Give us something that, that we've we've never experienced, Lord, and help us to go to new levels with you and to grow and to go deeper in relationship with you. And God, I just love you tonight. I praise you. I thank you. And I give you honor and glory. And the church said amen. 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 All right. So we're going to talk about fasting tonight. We're going to kind of unpack this a little bit. We started out last week talking about that. We started out last week talking about the benefits of fasting. We started out talking about some of the things that, that you may uh, encounter while you're fasting. And Jamie's going to put the PowerPoint up there for me tonight. And uh, and uh, I forgot to change the date on it. It's okay, though. Yeah, no worries. Um, and so we're just going to kind of talk about this tonight. And, and I want you guys to to remember you can ask questions. If you, you know, we're, I know we're not on Zoom. Uh, we don't have the little raise your hand button anymore, so just raise your hand or just, you know, speak out, whatever it is. Uh, James got the microphone there, that way if anybody has any questions, and, uh, you know, you're certainly welcome to grab it and use it. And, um, and we will uh, discuss fasting. I know today we were eating lunch, and, uh, and I got to thinking about what we had for lunch. It was such a wonderful lunch, and then I was like, yeah, I'm going to be talking about fasting inside of church. So, um yeah, so pretty interesting. So fasting is one of the, the most important aspects of growing your relationship with Christ. It's one of the most important things that you can do. The Bible talks about when you fast, when you give. Uh, it's not optional. Um, of course, fasting is something that you need to be prepared for. Fasting is something that you need to be spiritually ready for. Um, you know, I encourage everyone to fast, but I also encourage everyone to be prepared uh, to fast. Um, fasting is something that can definitely unlock some uh, spiritual warfare and some spiritual battles that can help bring growth into your life spiritually and uh, it can take you to greater and deeper levels with Jesus and with God and the Holy Spirit, but it can also open you up to attacks from the enemy. So fasting is something that you definitely need to be prepared for. Uh, next slide, please, sir. 
All right, so the definition of fasting. Fasting is the abstinence from something, usually food, as an element of private or public religious worship. Okay, in the Hebrew, it is to put your hand over your mouth. In the Greek, it means to abstain from something, usually food. So if we think about this here in the Hebrew, we think about if we put our hand over our mouth, can you eat when you put your hand over your mouth? I guess if you really, really wanted to, you could be able, you'd be able to get food down and you'd be able to eat. But in the Hebrew, it talks about you're placing your hand over your mouth, which is preventing you from getting things into your mouth. It's preventing you typically from getting food and maybe other objects in there. And in the Greek, of course, to abstain from something, usually food. Um, and so those are, the, those are the three definitions there. Um, you have the standard in the English and the Hebrew and Greek. Let's go to the next slide. Talk to fast. Okay, so the first time that we saw fasting uh, referenced in Scripture, it's actually referenced in Judges chapter 20, verse 26. Then all the Israelites, the whole army, went up to Bethel, and there they sat weeping before the Lord. They fasted that day until evening and presented burnt offerings and fellowship offerings to the Lord. Okay? How many of us in here have ever fasted before? We've, we've probably all fasted before. How many of us have ever stopped and looked at the process that we actually work through when we do a fast? Typically when I fast, um, I do a complete fast. I try to take everything out that my body needs. I'll drink, you know, minimal amounts of water to make sure that I stay hydrated because I know my body. Um, I know that when I begin to go without food and without water, I can get into the area of you know, getting headaches and stuff like that. So typically when I fast, I cut out everything. Now, there are different types of fasting. You know, there's the Daniel fast. Um, you know, I've had people that, you know, they fasted from sweets or they fasted from, you know, snacks or stuff like that. So there are different things that you can snack from. Um, and so typically when you, when you get into fasting, typically when you... When you're trying to draw, uh, draw closer to God and you're trying to grow and you're trying to go deeper with God and you begin to fast, when you start taking things that your body actually needs and you start removing them from your day-to-day -day, uh, diet, or you start, you say, you, you say, okay, you know, I know that I need to eat three meals a day to be healthy. I know that I need three meals a day to be strong. I know that I need to do this and do this. When you start pushing the plate away and you start denying your body the things that you need and you start going to the Lord in prayer, uh, you start going to the Lord in worship, you start praising God while you're fasting. He's going to provide for you all those necessary things. He's going to give you what you need to, to continue on and to get through the fast. Um, you, you know, I mean, think about it like this. We're, 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 we have this desire to go further with God. So we've decided that the thing that we need to live and survive is food. We're willing to put that aside and we're willing to get deeper with God and go further with him. And so what he does is, is when we begin to pray, we begin to get into that fast and we begin to worship him, he begins to give us strength. There have been times where I have fasted that I would get into a fast and I'd be in the maybe second or the third day or something like that. And I begin to settle in. I begin to you know get into the point that I'm no longer focusing on, okay, well, I haven't eaten in two days or I haven't eaten in three days. I've gotten to the point now where... I'm okay. And now my focus is on nothing but Jesus. And I think that's the most important, one of the most important aspects of fasting is if you sit there and you think about I haven't eaten today, or you know, I didn't have my coffee at breakfast, or you know, I didn't have my dessert after dinner, or you know, you start thinking about those kind of things, your focus is not quite where it needs to be yet. You're getting there because you've acknowledged the fact that now you're fasting, but you haven't gotten to the point yet where your focus has gotten straight on God. And that's where we've got to get to when we fast. Um, any questions? Questions, comments, concerns, emotional outbursts so far? I was like, got an emotional outburst probably. <laughs> His hand raised up there. Anything to be added to it? All right. Let's keep, let's keep going here just a little bit. Let's go to the next slide. Let's talk about Jesus in the wilderness, okay? So Jesus' first step after baptism was to go into the wilderness and fast for 40 days. Can anybody tell me why it was significant that Jesus fasted for 40 days and why he went into the wilderness to do so? Why did Jesus go into the wilderness and fast? Why did he do it in the wilderness? So I believe it's um, when he was baptized, mm -hmm. he's cleansed, and then he's going out to cleanse 
the inside of his body and away from everything else. He has no um, outside world influence. It's just him with God. Right? Yep, absolutely. So he's going out there to do that cleanse. He's going out there to, you know, he's got, he's been baptized and, you know, he's been washed, you know, and I mean, he was without sin, he was without blemish. Um, but he's been cleansed now by the baptism. Uh, what else might, what other reason might he have gone into the wilderness to fast? Anybody have a prayer closet? Why don't we go into a prayer closet? To be alone. To be alone. Yep, to be alone. So there are times where, and, and, and to reference this with Jesus here, he was getting alone because he wanted to get so, even though he was God and God was in him, you know, even though he was that, he still wanted to be so in tune with the Father that he got, he had to get away. He recognized and he understood that getting away from all distractions Getting away from everything that would distract him, from everything that would would maybe grab his attention, or maybe he would say, "Okay, I got to get this done first, and then I can go and I can do this fasting." He decided that everything that was going on, it was more important for him to get away and break away from society, break away from the disciples, break away from everybody, and just focus on the Father. And that's one of the things that when we fast. That's what we've got to do. Now, I understand that we all work jobs and we all have things that we do and, you know, we have lives and, and you know, children and, and so on and so forth. But it's so important that when we fast, we still find that time to just break away. We've got to find that time where we can get away from everything that we are going through the day, everything that we're thinking about, everything that we're seeing, everything that we're experiencing. We've got to be able to get away from that. And we've got to be able to push that aside so that we can get that dedicated time straight to God. Because I understand, you know, it's a, we work eight hour days, 10 hour days, 12 hour days, you know, 40 hour weeks plus, you know, all that. But if, when we fast, we've got to make sure that we can push aside and set aside time for God. Now, it'd be great to go out in the wilderness for 40 days. I can't imagine what he went through in that 40 days. I know for me, like at the end of a fast, you know, if I've you know, fasted four, five, six days, whatever, I'm tired, I'm hungry, like, you know, my body's a little weaker. You know, your body feels it. And, but here he was, he did it for 40 days. And then when he came out of that fast, after that 40, you know, out of the 40 days, the enemy came right to him and came right at him. And he, and he was, he was, physically he was weaker. And the enemy thought that because he was weaker, that he could get into him and he could mess with him and he could really throw him off. And so he started offering, hey, listen, I'll give you all this as you can see. I'll give you all this over here. And he reminds the devil. He's like, you know, Satan, that's great, but you can't give me what I already own. You can't give me something that already belongs to me. And so that's why we see, you know, the 40-day fast with Jesus in the wilderness. Any questions there? Okay, all right, let's move on a little bit here. Let's move over to Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, we're going to talk about the wilderness here a little bit. If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Verse 4 says, Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Let's look at this for a little bit here. Let's look at verse 2 here. Back up one slide for me there. Let's look at this, verses 1, 2, and 3. Verse 1 says that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Who was he led by? Who was Jesus led by? The Spirit. The Spirit. The Spirit led him into the wilderness to be what? Tempted. Tempted by the devil. Okay? So in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, it says that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Let's talk about that for a minute. Why do you think he was led into the wilderness by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil? Because he was 
Let's, let's talk about this a little bit. Open form here. Somebody grab that mic. Let's talk. Or look at me with funny looks. And that seems like whatever. Why do you guys think the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil? It literally tells us that the Spirit, capital S, Spirit, led him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Why? Why would the Spirit lead Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil? So I may be way off base here, but uh, I believe there's some scripture about the devil came and wanted to claim Moses' body, and it's to angel Michael. Was it Michael or Gabriel? I'm not sure, but one of them um, said, um, the Lord rebukes you. He couldn't even stand up to the devil. I think that the Spirit led Jesus out there to show us something. To show us that he is the true son of God. That he could do what an archangel couldn't do. He could stand up to the devil uh, using the word. You know, and we learned about that in the, uh, the armor of God. That the Bible is our sword. And, and Jesus struck back at Satan with the sword. And said, no, I'm not... There's nothing you can say to me. There's nothing you can give me that, that's going to make me change the way that I am. But I think he led. I think the Spirit led Jesus out there to show the world that Jesus was the Son of God and could stand up against the devil. Absolutely. What else? Let's 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 apply it to to us now. Go ahead. Uh, I think it was uh, the the introduction of. Uh, just kind of showing that this spiritual warfare, spiritual battle going on, and then introducing uh, fasting as a, a means to uh, help get through that battle, that spiritual warfare, that spiritual battle. That's a, uh, I guess you could say, kind of, kind of like a, a combative way to confront spiritual warfare is through fasting. Absolutely, a combative way. To go after spiritual warfare, a combative way to and Jamie, you were you were correct too. That's a good point there. Um, but yes, a combative way to go after <laughs> spiritual warfare. How many of us in here have ever gotten into a fast and spiritual warfare shows up like right after? Like I remember, it was what a few weeks back. I can't remember. I can't remember. Recently, I fasted, and you would have thought that like. <laughs> That if, let's just say this was the door. <laughs> we just like dumped out all the mess that, that, that the devil could dump out at one time. And man, I'm telling you, like I, we went through some spiritual warfare, and um, man, it was like it was intense. But guess what? I'm still standing here, and I kept fasting. I continued my fast. I didn't stop. And I think, and let me say this, and this is one of the most important things that I can share with you: when you go into a fast. Whether you're going in like we're talking about here, being led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, to have that combative uh, action against spiritual warfare, or if you're going into fasting with trying to, uh, you know, maybe you've got something, you know, some kind of an addiction, or you've got something that like is is hindering you from getting like fully into the uh, to to closer to God, or you're you're seeking after the baptism. I've seen people fast to, to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, go ahead. Breaking of strongholds. Yeah, breaking of strongholds. So in any of this stuff that you're going into with fasting, any of that, you're trying to break strongholds, you're trying to go closer to God, you're trying to break chains off of you. When the devil shows up, keep going. Don't stop. I think one of the best things about this was that Jesus was led by the Spirit. The Spirit was with him. Look at this. The Spirit was with Jesus. When you fast, the Spirit is with you. Oh man. The Spirit is with you. Okay? Jesus didn't have to worry about the fact that he was going into the wilderness 
and would be alone. Yes, he was going to be physically alone, but the spirit was going with him. But look at this. Also, the devil was going with him. The devil's like, I'm going along for the ride, right? But the spirit said, I'm taking you out here. I am going with you. So there are times where when the spirit leads us into the wilderness to break those strongholds, to break those, those chains of bondage, to break those things, to get freedom. You're not in the back. You guys have heard me say this. Don't fight the devil on his turf. Fight him on yours. Which means, like we know in, in Psalms 23, I, he's prepared a table in the presence of my enemy. We have nothing to fear, right? So when we get led into the wilderness by the spirit to be tempted by the devil, the spirit's going with us. And all we've got to do is trust, have faith, and believe, right? Any questions there? Anything to be added to that part right there? We know the Spirit is leading us. We know the Spirit is with us. The Spirit was with Jesus. He was with him in the, in the wilderness. And he was right there with him when the devil tempted him. All right, so let's move on a little bit here. Verse 3, that the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. The devil will mock you if, he, if you give him the chance. Okay? He's going to try to mock you. He's going to try to do what he can to make you feel like you are less than you are. What we see here in verse 3 is the tempter came to him and said, If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. The, devil was, the tempter was mocking Jesus. And he was mocking him. Talking about, look, you're not as powerful as you say you are. You're not as great as you think you are. You're not the Messiah that everybody says you are. You're not the this, you're not that. And so he was mocking him here. But all this was right here, and it, and it makes me think about Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel was in that lion's den, but he had faith in God. He trusted in God. Jesus was standing there with the tempter, the, the, the enemy, the devil, the one person that is on this earth to see the destruction of this earth. And he, he, he's mocking him. That's why it talks about the still small voice. We've got to know which voice we're hearing, right? Jesus isn't paying any attention to this. As a matter of fact, when this transpired, when this was spoken to Jesus, he responded in verse four here. Jesus answered, go to the next slide. It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Right there, he identified and he separated our spiritual life and our physical life. He showed us right there in that moment that we can't survive on just bread alone. He showed us in that moment that we can't survive on just this water. He showed us in that moment that there is more that we need in order to live and more that we need in order to survive. You guys have heard me preach on dying spiritually. I did not know that there was more that I needed. I didn't know that Matthew 4, uh, 4 and 4 existed. But you see, I was dying spiritually. And so this is proof here that you can't live on bread alone. You can't survive on it. But on every word that comes from the mouth of God, if you want to know how to survive, here it is. You've got to feed yourself this word of God. You have to give yourself a daily dose, if not minute by minute, hour by hour dose of the word of God because it will help you survive. It'll help you live. It'll help you have your being. It'll help you have your existence. And that's what's happening all over the world now is people are depending just on food alone. But Jesus identified quickly you're not surviving on just food alone. You need more. You need every word that comes from the mouth of God to survive. 
Questions, comments, concerns, emotional outbursts there? You want to shout in the spirit and run the aisles? Go for it. All right, let's, uh, let's move forward here. We'll go to the next slide. We'll go to God's definition of fasting. If you guys want to, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 58, verses 1 through 7. We talked about this last week, but Isaiah 58, verses 1 through 7. It says, shout it aloud, do not hold back, raise your voice like a trumpet, declare to my people their rebellion, and to the descendants of Jacob their sins, for day after day they seek me out, they seem eager to know my ways, as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen, only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? It is not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. So let's kind of walk down verse by verse here, Isaiah 58, 1 and 2, shout it aloud, do not hold back, raise your voice like a trumpet, declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins, for day after day they seek me out, they seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager, eager for God to come near them. Right away in Isaiah 58, 1 and 2, shout it aloud. Do not hold back. We're starting out this, this chapter with praise. We're starting out this chapter with raising your voice. We're starting out this chapter with shouting to the Lord as we go into our fast. Now, there's some correction that we see throughout Isaiah 58, um, verses 1 through 7, and we'll get into that in just a minute. But I think one of the key aspects that we need to remember and understand is that when we fast, we need to be praising God as well. When we go through difficult times, when we go through these trials, or we've gotten into this combative mindset with this spiritual warfare, we need to go ahead and praise God and give God the glory for what he's going to do for us when he brings us through this fast. Remember, we saw in Matthew 4 and 1 through 4 that the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So we know that when we go into fasting, if we go in there with the mindset of praise that what you're going into the fast for shall be done according to his perfect will, there is always something to be thankful for. There's always something to praise God for. Now, the key to this is we need to lift our voices to give God the honor and the glory that's due to him for the work that he's going to do through us during our fast. Let's talk about that for just a second. Why would it be important to praise God during our fast? Why would it be important to praise God? He desires, he desires our praise. Yep, he desires our praise. What else? Why else should we praise God during our fasting? Why 
I also will praise him. What does the devil hate? I know that's a lot. You can, you can open up a whole list of things there. The enemy hates when we praise our God. He hates it. He despises it. He does not want the word of God to be spoken aloud. He does not want us to be praising. That's a reason to praise God. And that's a reason to shout to God. All right, let's move forward here a little bit more. Let's go down to, go down to the slide, uh, Jesus' word about fasting, Matthew 6, 16 through 18. So jump two, two slides there for me. Maybe three slides. One more. Keep going. There we go. Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18 says, when you fast, we're going to talk about fasting here, okay? Now this is this is now now we're gonna kind of open up this part here. And before I read the scripture, I want, I want to say this to you. Should we be telling people that we're fasting? Should we be should we should we be walking around, oh, woe is me, poor pitiful is me, I'm fasting? Should we be why shouldn't we do that? Let's talk about it for a second. Why shouldn't we tell people? Yep. One and two, um, just as the Pharisees pray on the street corner loudly, they already received their reward from from man. Versus, we're seeking a reward from God. Yes. Understanding or a closer relationship or whatever we're fasting for. Yep, absolutely. So if you're fasting to get attention from people, then your reward is going to be the attention that you get from people. But if you're fasting to get closer to God and, and to, to, to have that breakthrough from God or to receive something from God, your reward is not going to come from people because you have kept your fasting in secrecy. You've done your fasting in the quiet place. You've done your fasting in your prayer closet. You've done your fasting in the wilderness. When Jesus went in the wilderness, it was just him, the spirit, and the devil. He didn't have a whole group of people. And I think that's another reason that he, he was led out into the wilderness. Because I believe the Spirit of, I believe the Lord wanted us to see that when we fast, don't let other people see you. Because this is a special time to draw close to God. This is a special time that we're trying to receive something from the Lord and not from people. And Allison, you said something to me last week, and I can't remember. What in the world you said now about fasting? And I'm drawing a blank. I'm trying to remember. I don't know. Like, I'll, hopefully it'll come to me in a second here. But it's so important that we don't let people know because when that happens. Now, now let me say this. When I fast, I'll tell Allison. I'll let Allison know. Okay? That's, I believe that's, I believe in my heart, my spirit, that that's okay. If you, you know, that she's my spouse, I can let her know I'm fasting. I also believe that, that if you guys were to come to me and say, hey, pastor, I'm fasting, please pray for me. I believe that's okay as well. What's not okay, though, is for us to, for me to get up here and tell the whole church, hey, I'm fasting for this. And, and everybody knows that I'm fasting. And I've taken it away from the glory of God and, and that special connection with God. And I put that connection on attention. And pride and and and, uh, and arrogance and haughtiness and all that kind of stuff. I've taken the special like a specialness is not a specialness a word. It's gonna be a word tonight. Specialness of fasting. It's that specialness of drawing in with God and getting close to God. It's probably not a word, but we're going with it. So when so if we didn't have this scripture here, if we didn't have Matthew chapter six verses sixteen through eighteen, then it would not be an issue. To talk about fasting, right? However, we're giving specific instructions here from the Lord that says, When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting. 
but only to your Father, who is unseen, and your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. So we're supposed to just go on about our day-to-day -day business, right? And we're not supposed to let people know. Right? It tells us those that let people know have already received their reward. There's nothing else coming. Like you talked about, Jamie, the, the, the Pharisees, they would pray in the streets. They would pray on the corners. They would be loud. They would be drawing attention. They wanted people to see that they were educated and smart and eloquent in their prayers. But their prayers were worthless. They were worthless. And the reason they were worthless is because they were seeking attention for themselves. Don't let your fasting be to seek attention for yourself. Do you have something to say? Yes. Grab the mic. Grab the mic. I can't hear you. Yes, you can. Okay. Um, I was going to say, I don't think it's a sin to let people know you're fasting. Um, I do think we have to be careful because it can become a prideful issue. Mm -hmm. We can become hypocrites, like the Bible is saying there in Matthew. Um, and our reward does need to be with our Father, not look at me, look at what I'm doing. But I don't think it's a sin to tell people, especially people close to you, or if we're doing a corporate fast. Obviously, the church you know, you know, if we're all fasting together, we're all right. going to know that. Um, or if, you know, like... I don't know if, if there's something you, you can't attend, like a certain event, because there's, you know, it would be rude for you to refuse food. You know, you could quietly maybe say that or something like that. But um, I don't think it's always a sin to tell someone you're fasting. Right. Okay. And and, and I would agree. I, I agree with you. Um, especially if, if it's done in the right way frame of mind, the right mindset, the right intention. Um, anybody ever known somebody that just needed attention all the time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jezebel needs attention all the time, doesn't she? Yeah, we're going to unpack Jezebel here in a couple weeks. <laughs> but I, but I, Allison, I, I agree with you. Um, I, I don't think it's, a, it's, it's certainly not a bad thing. It's not a sin to share with someone that you are fasting as long as you're not doing it with that pharisaical mindset that, oh, hey, I want attention because I'm fasting and you're not, and I'm better than you, and I'm greater than you, and I'm holier than you, all that. Now, as long as you're not doing that, I believe you're okay. Now, if you're running around looking somber like the hypocrites, that if you're drawing this attention, then no, you're not, you're not, you're not okay with that. You're not doing that right. But if you're sharing it with others so that they can be in support of you and they can lift you up and encourage you and push you, there, there's been times that I've fasted that if it were not for her prayers, I may not have made it through my fast. And I recognize that and I realize that that she was in tune with the Holy Spirit to pray specifically over me so that I could make it into my fast and, and be strong in my fast. So I don't think it's, a, yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. We can, I believe you can tell other people it not be a sin as long as you do it, not for attention, but to be, I think, in unity. I, I think in unity. I think, um, you know, I saw something on a, a sermon last night, you know, talking about unity in the body of Christ. That means unity with the church of God, unity with the assemblies of God, the Methodist church, the, the Baptist church, the Southern Baptist Convention. The, the every the Asian church, the black churches, the Mexican churches, the Chinese church, that's the whole body of Christ. That's unity. Good sermon, wasn't it? It was. I was watching over here. Yeah, praise the Lord. Love them, man. Praise him. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Bless him. Bless him. Um, so yeah, so let's move on here. So yeah, not a sin to not a sin to, to, to share that. Let's go down to fasting as true worship. So go two slides for me there. We're going to flip back over to Isaiah chapter 58, verses 8 through 12 here. And I'm going to read this, and then we're going to talk about fasting as true worship. But it says, Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, 
with the pointing finger and malicious talk. And if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness. And your night will become like the new day. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called the repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. Let's talk about a few of God's promises here. In Isaiah 58 and 8, can anybody see the promises in this scripture? Anybody see anything in there? Then your light will break forth like the dawn. And your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you. And the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Can we see any promises in that scripture? What are they? What do you see? Yeah, grab the mic. I take one, two. Protection. Yep, protection. Healing. Healing, yep. Uh, we are broken away from oppression. Mm-hmm. It could also be called guidance. Yep. What else? One more thing there. Help when you cry out. Yep. Help. One more thing that's in there. Look at the third word. Protection. Then your light. So let's talk about the light for a second, right? We know that light cannot be overtaken by the darkness, right? And the darkness cannot comprehend the light, correct? We understand that, right? Light and darkness cannot coexist. It's either light in here or it's dark in here. We have the lights on, it's light in here. There's no darkness in here right now. Because the light overcomes and overwhelms and overtakes the darkness. Like in this room over in here now. We have lights in there that are very bright. And we have overcome the darkness in that room. Praise the Lord. But let's think about this for a second here. What comes with light? Does light make you happy? Does light bring joy? I know light brings joy to me. Light can also mean it's bringing prosperity. The light can also mean that it's salvation brought by the Lord. Your light. What does the Bible tell us that we are to be? We're called to be the what? The salt and the light of the earth. Right? Do you think your light shines brighter after fasting? Why? Why do you think your light shines brighter after fasting? Because you spent time with him. Think about this for a minute. When Moses came down off the mountain, what did he look like? Yeah. Say it louder with the microphone. Look. <laughs> Lisa's like, you're home. <laughs> he was, oh man, I was just making sure you want to shout right now. Moses, when he came down off the mountain, he was glowing. Why? Because he'd been in the presence of God. Because he had been in the presence of God. When you fast and you bring your flesh into subjection, you bring your mind into subjection, you subdue it, you bring it under your control, and you say, okay, I'm on flesh, you are under my command right now. I am not going to pay attention to being hungry. I'm not going to pay attention to the desire to eat, the want to eat, the need to eat. I am only focused on God. When Moses was up on that mountain and he was in the glory and the presence of God Almighty, you think he was thinking about what was going on down below? Chaos was going on down below. Aaron became the, 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 the idiot of the group and decided that it was okay to listen to everybody else and say, we've got to make something to worship now because Moses is up there getting what he needs. Let me tell you this. When you are fasting, you're getting what you need. You don't worry about what's going on around you. Don't pay attention to what is going on around you. 
You know what? When I fast, I'm not worried about getting something for my family in that moment. Because I know that when I do my fasting and I get in the presence of God, the light will become bright and it will shine and it will reflect and shine into the life of my children and my wife and my family and it'll shine into the light of all the people in the church. So when I am getting into the presence of God Almighty, it's for me. Moses came down low. Now yes, he was not up there fasting, but he was up there, but your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Man, holy cow. Let's talk about God's promises here just a little bit more. Verse, verse 9. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and the malicious talk. What are some promises that we see in verse 9? There's two, there's two promises there. Mm -hmm. And if he's there, then what did he do? What's that song? Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want. When you cry for help, he comes to your need. The Lord will answer. He'll hear your cries for help. And it said, as here I am, the presence of Jesus, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Let's go to verse 11 there, 58 and 11. The Lord will guide you always. We're almost done here. Two more, two more slides. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land that will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. What promises do we see there? There's three of them. Yep, he'll never fail us. So that means that he would guide us always, right? So if he doesn't fail us, he's going to guide us. What else? Supplies. Yep, he's going to satisfy your needs, material and spiritual when barren. And he'll be like a spring that never fails. We will have the living water, right? Okay. All right, so let's move on there. Fasting is worship. No. Wait. Oh, you're behind. Yeah, way behind. My media guy not paying attention back there. What happens when you take vacation? You gotta do things. Right, Carl? Look for the slide. Yeah, there. Fasting is worship. Go ahead and put that up there. Fasting humbles the soul before God, denies and masters the appetite, gives us power over demonic oppression, aids in prayer, and manifests an earnest desire to seek God. That last one right there, the manifest and earnest desire to seek God. If that's not your intention, don't fast. Don't fast. Fasting is not just so you can say, God, I need you to give me a new car. I want a new car. I need a new car. Don't jump into a fast just because you want something. Let your want and your desire be to seek God first. That's why the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Don't go fast. I remember one time, and, 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 and the, the more I think about this and the further away from this that we are, I think about, I was, I was kind of wrong for this, but I fasted one time to go to the beach on vacation. We had come home from Alaska. We wanted to go to the beach. Now, my desire, my Bible tells me that the, that the Lord, that God will give us the desires of our heart. So the desire of my heart was to be able to go to the beach with my wife 
a beach that had waves and all that kind of stuff and, and sand. I mean, I love the beach in Alaska, but totally different. I wanted to go to the beach. That was my desire. But I realized that it was a very selfish desire. What my desire first should have been was to draw closer to God and then make my request known to him that I wanted to go to the beach. Not, I'm fasting so I can go to the beach. I realized that my approach was wrong. He still honored that. He still made a way for us to go to the beach. But I realized years later, my approach was wrong. Because my approach did not begin with an earnest desire to seek God. Why should you have a desire to seek God when you fast? Why? Grab the mic, Allison. Yep. What's the point? What's the point? Does the Bible say seek ye first the material things of life and then maybe go after God? Maybe in second hesitations or something like that. But it doesn't say to seek after the, the, the stuff of life. It says to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. How many different times have we talked about or seen righteousness in, in scripture tonight with fasting? That's something that comes with it. I am not righteous because I am Caleb. I can only be righteous because Jesus dwells within me. It's nothing that I do. It's only the indwelling of Jesus Christ in my heart and giving my life to Christ that I can live a life of righteousness. So if you're not going to have that earnest desire to seek God, don't do it. And then let's talk about some things. What are you fasting for? Remember, manifest an earnest desire to seek God first, okay? But you can fast for health. You can fast for health, for guidance, for understanding, for your faith, believing God, for satisfying your needs, deeper intimate relationship with Christ, and gain heaven's perspective. I think that one's a pretty important one. Why would we want to gain heaven's perspective? Why do we want to gain heaven's perspective? Because our perspective on earth is blind. Right? We're limited on what we can see. Yep. What else? So we're limited by what we can see. The Bible tells us what? By, not by our own understanding. Right? So if not by our understanding, then by whose understanding? God's perspective, right? A heavenly understanding, a heavenly perspective. Fasting will give you insight into things that you cannot know, understand, or comprehend. My mind can only understand and, and believe and, and, and know, but so much. But God is all knowing, right? So His perspective can give us more than anything. Go ahead. So, do you think that by gaining heaven's perspective, that is more gaining? I don't feel like I can see things from God's perspective because I'm limited as a person. So right. I think that it would strengthen my faith in understanding that what I know to be true will condemn me to death. But my faith in God and His Word is what, you know, and, and the sacrifice that Christ made is what gives me life. Yep. I, I think I think an argument could definitely be made for that. Um, I think when, when I think about a heavenly perspective, I think about discernment from the Holy Spirit. Um, I think a deeper a deeper understanding through discernment from the Holy Spirit. Um, I definitely think you could make the argument that yes, by your faith, um, you know, you, you can gain a, a deeper heavenly perspective because, like you said, you know, the perspective that we have and the understanding that we have, it's not enough. It, you know, it doesn't. It doesn't go far enough. It doesn't. It doesn't hit deep enough. It doesn't look deep enough because we're limited in, in our understanding. But I think. I think to me, um, yeah, faith could be put in that. But I, I believe it's. It's more of a uh, deeper discernment from the Holy Spirit. Um, and uh, and and yeah. Revelation. Revelation. Michael. Revelation. 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 <laughs> I'm trying. 
Yep, it, it's Revelation. Yep, so Revelation. So how many times have you guys read Scripture before and maybe you read it again and you see something different that you didn't see the first time, right? Or you understand something. What, what was it? I preached Black Bartimaeus within like twice in what, six weeks, something like that, maybe six, seven weeks. Because the first time I preached it, I preached on one aspect, but then when, when God showed me taking off that garment of, of uh, worldly identity. Yes, worldly identity. Yep. Didn't see that the first several times I preached through that story, you know, in my ministry. So, yeah, so so I think that discernment, that revelation, um, that like Allison said, revelation that God gives us knowledge, deeper understanding, deeper and different perspective, heavenly perspective. Um, so, awesome. All right, let's wrap it up. Thoughts, comments, what you got? I just want to read this. Uh, microphone. It says that, I don't need a microphone. <laughs> it says, prayer and fasting provides freedom. Yes. And I believe that um, because um, I know that when I go through anxiety attacks or just having a really bad day, and I and I turn to the Word of God. I find that my freedom there, um, mm -hmm. and that I, I think that stands true for fasting. But it says here, when we pray and fast, God promises that He will liberate us. He will loose the chains of injustice. He declares that He'll untie the cords of the yoke and will give the oppressed their long-awaited freedom. And I find that very, I mean, just through my experience, what I've gone through in life, the more time I spend with God, the less anxiety I have. And I, I have just found that to be true. Uh, it's like last week, every morning, I was into work, every morning and evening. And I hate to say it, but this week, I haven't done that, and I have felt anxiety again. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is, but just being in the Word of God just gives me such freedom. If that makes any sense. Yeah. So. Do you have something to add there? I was just thinking about how the word of God brings life. And I think that means not only to your spiritual self, but your physical body and your mental health. I mean, yeah. And so I'm not saying we don't need mental health stuff, but the word of God does bring life into all areas of your life if we will allow it to be. If we'll get it and spend that time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, there's so much that can be said about freedom with the Word of God. I mean, it sets you free from oppression, it sets you free from bondage, it sets you free from, um, you know, spiritual warfare attacks. I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and there's a, it, it's kind of like when you put on the armor of God. Right. You know, you put on that armor of God, you're prepared for battle. And I feel like, I feel like every day that I wake up, and I, and I know this because we're doing things here that, that, that the enemy's not happy with. Like being in here tonight, he's, you know, I was messaging Alicia earlier. I was like, man, this has been a hectic day. And she agreed. And she, and she said that the enemy was trying to keep us all busy and wear us down before we could get here tonight. But look at this. We're all here. Right. And so there's something about getting into the word of God. Because if you look at it from, from a perspective of you're not just like reading the word. You're getting into a relationship with God. You're getting into a relationship with the living Word of God. And, and that's like, you know, with me and Allison. If I didn't talk to her every day, we wouldn't have a good relationship. If I didn't talk to you guys, you know, when I can, we wouldn't have a good relationship. You guys wouldn't want to fellowship with me, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's exactly what it is. It's, it's like, I know that when I'm having a really bad day or something, I can go to my best friend, my confidant. I can go to my, my partner. I can, I can go to her and I can talk and share and, and express and, you know, let frustrations out. You do the same thing with the Word of God, and that's the, it provides that that protection and that blanket of safety um, for us. So, awesome comment there. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Also keep your perspective in line with, you know, it's not always about having a big 
his house, right next to his car, right. all the money in the bank, and, and all this other stuff that it buys you money in heaven. So having that, that uh, heavenly and eternal perspective, it kind of keeps you in check with what's really important and where your, your real your true joy is. Yeah, absolutely. Because let's think about it like this. Jamie has talked about, you know, over the course of the last year, he has grown tremendously with Christ. He's grown tremendously in the Word. He's, his relationship has expanded. And the decisions that he makes now are, are more eternally focused than they were previously. And I think every one of us has been there in our life. We've made decisions that weren't eternally focused. So having that heavenly perspective, like you were saying, Alicia, you know, eternity, you're thinking about things and, and you know, the etern eternality, we can make eternal decisions because we have a heavenly perspective. Whereas if we didn't have a heavenly perspective, then we don't, there, we don't have an understanding of what an eternal decision is. Like there's things that I'm not going to do in my life because I know that they are eternal decisions that will not lead me to heaven, right? And that's because we have that heavenly perspective. So good call up there. Thank you. Anything else to be added before we wrap it up? So I wanted to jump off of that, that what Amisha said with the eternal perspective, looking at it as eternity, you can then look back at the, the sufferings that Paul went through and how he was able to still have joy in the worst times of his life because he was focused on God. He was focused mm -hmm. on Christ. He was focused on that eternal perspective versus this worldly perspective where we can be judged by man all day long because their judgment is temporary where God's judgment is eternal. Yep, absolutely. Yep. Anything else to be added? Isaac, do you have anything to add? No? Alright, well, so that, that wraps up fasting uh, for tonight, and um, that wraps up our study on fasting, and so we will move into something else next Wednesday night. Um, but I do want to thank you guys for coming out tonight. I do want to thank you for participating tonight. Um, hopefully we can... Uh, um, we can figure out a, a good way to get everybody to participate and, and have everybody included. Because I know our, our folks that are used to getting on Zoom, that's probably a little bit different for them tonight. And uh, Dave and Jill, we definitely missed you guys. Wish you could have been here with us. And uh, we'll, we'll try to figure out uh, some kind of a way to get you guys incorporated. Um, and um, but I do thank you guys for coming out. So don't forget, next Wednesday night, 7 p.m., we'll be back in here. Uh, keepers of the command will be live in action next Wednesday night. Uh, Alicia will be leading that, and uh, she'll be taking the reins on the youth ministry. Very excited about that. Pretty pumped yeah. up. And uh, and so we're looking forward to that. If you know youth 12 and up that are looking for somewhere to hang out on Wednesday night, come learn about the Lord, and, uh, and be a part of the youth ministry here. Let them know. Invite them. We'll put a post on Facebook this week uh, for that. And um, and that way that's out there. Also, another announcement, um, and I just thought about this one, April 27th, Women of the Well. Our women's ministry will be launching on April 27th. That's a Tuesday night at 7 p.m. It will be here at the church in the Fellowship Hall. Their first meeting uh, will be here. So, Jamie, I guess you and I, we we'll need to figure out something to do on April 27th. And, uh, and yeah, I'll take the kids with us. Um, and we'll go, maybe we'll go tear up CCs or something like that. And, and uh, you know, so we'll have some pizza. Uh, but April 27th, 7 p.m., Women of the Well. I'm very excited about this. It's been a long time coming. It's been a long journey. We're finally launching this women's ministry. Nora will be leading the women's ministry. Um, she's very excited. She's very excited about that. She's like, Jim is excited as well. Um, but I'm very excited about that. And I'm very proud of that because we have come so far in this church. We're launching new ministries. Our children's ministry is going strong. Carmen and Mandy are heading that up right now. They're doing a phenomenal job. If you've got kids and you're in the area, bring them. Um, our youth ministry is launching. Our keepers of the command. We've got our women of the well. 
And then I guess we have like our men's tools ministry that we remodeled the church and, and that's how we do for men right now. Um, but I'm just, I'm so excited about what God's doing. Um, so come out and join us uh, Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Uh, we hope to see you here. Bring your family, bring your friends, uh, bring everybody you can and come out and worship the Lord with us. And if you guys would just stay with me tonight and we'll go ahead and do the Lord in prayer and dismiss. It's me. It's good. I bumped the antenna the wrong way. It's touchy. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much that we can come together tonight. I thank you, God. It's just. Lord, it felt so good to be in this sanctuary tonight, God, and to do this here on Wednesday night and to be with fellow believers, God, in the body of Christ, our, our, our church family, God. Lord, I pray for our youth ministry, God, that will be launching and going strong, God. I pray for our children's ministry, Lord, that, that you would continue to grow. And I pray for our women's ministry, our women of the well, God, that will be launching. And I pray for the men's ministry, God, that you would, you would raise up someone who has a burden to lead that, Lord. And God, I pray for our services on Wednesday night, God, that you would lead us and guide us in the direction that you would have for us to go, Lord, and, and that you would just help us and, and just speak to us, God. And Lord, I pray tonight that God if we if we draw closer to you God that we we will receive the blessings God will receive the glory because we'll be in your glorious presence God and it will transfigure us oh Lord and let us be the salt and the light of this community God continue to do the work that you're doing in this church and in our lives oh God and God we just love you tonight we praise you we thank you. We give you honor and glory. And the church said amen. 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 I love you guys. Everyone have a wonderful evening. And we'll see you Sunday morning. God bless.